21st century, this is a hard text to read and people embrace. Because in the 21st century, for every sickness, every illness, we have described a medication, a therapist. We have attributed it to being physiological, in some cases psychological, and then applied a pharmaceutical answer to those problems. But that was not true in the ancient world. In the ancient world, people understood the reality that sometimes evil spirits could possess people. That the idea of being possessed demonically was a very real idea in the ancient world. Modern Americans have anesthetized themselves to this idea, even though they go to the movies in droves to see paranormal activity, buy into ghost stories. When talk about the spirit world develops, they get squeamish. In parts of third world countries where missionaries serve, they tell me that the reality of the spirit world is so graphic that most Americans could not adjust when they encounter and experience it. What you call magic here is nothing more than sleight of hand. It's somebody tricking you to not see what you think you see. There are places in the world where magic actually occurs. No explanation for it, no sleight of hand. It's really magic. And they would read this text and they would appreciate the reality of the spirit world and demon possession as a very real entity in our culture. Jesus comes to this place where he is trying to communicate his superiority even over the spirit world in chapter 5. Here you have a man who has lost all self-control. He's running around the graveyard like an animal. And in fact, the word subdue in chapter, chapter 5 is a translated word meaning tame. There were people trying to tame a man as if they would an animal. He's lost self-control, and he's lost all sense of decency. The man is naked, running through a graveyard, out of control, and naked. He's lost his family and his friends, because Jesus will send him back there before he departs from this place. And, and one of the things you've got to at least grapple with, is the way in which God's grace manifested in a graveyard. First seeks, then saves, and then sins. And this is the essence of what you see happening in Mark chapter 5. When Jesus goes to the other side of the lake, he goes with a motive and intention. And Jesus will pass through a storm to eventually get to this man and this city. When you read verses 1, it says, So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. This man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. And whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he was often, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. And when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. And with a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? This man, this demon-possessed man, this man who has become an apartment complex for the demonic. 6,000 residing in one man. He has not come to Jesus. They have not come to Jesus because they want to worship. They have come bowing and screeching, but, but they haven't come to worship. Jesus has come seeking. And whenever you deal with God in a sort of 
graveyard environment, you should at least know that it is always God who seeks you. You don't seek God. The good news about God is that when you couldn't seek him, he was seeking you. In fact, there's a doctrine called prevenient grace that suggests whenever we turn to God, it's not because we turn to God, it's because God first turns to us. It's the idea of being held in the hollow of his hand and praying for him to hold you up. And then realizing that it was his hand that was holding you up all along. Left to our own devices, human beings would never go after God. That is the Genesis account. Adam, where are you? God seeking humanity. Because humanity will never turn to God. And when you begin to seek God, it's only because you've already been sought. The fundamental nature of us is to run from God, not to run to God. And what I love about God is even when I run from him, he runs after me. You have never been loved like that by anybody who as long as you try to get away from him, you says, no, I won't let it happen. I'll pursue you even when you won't pursue me. That's why you woke up this morning. That's why you laid down last night and got up today. That's why you can see, hear, speak, move, and have the facility of bodily motion and speech. It's because he loves you, not because you and I have loved him. And the only reason why you are who you are right now is because of his effort, not your efforts. That's why when you realize who you are, what you should deserve, what you could be, you can't help but bow your head and say, Lord, I thank you. Do I have a witness anywhere? Every now and then you can't help but say, God, I'm so glad you are the way that you are. God has loved you when you didn't love yourself. Here's a man naked, out of control that the community can't control. And God has gone, Jesus has gone to search him out. The strange thing about this text, at least in my mind, is that that there is this idea of God seeking in the graveyard and a society that has discovered it can't do anything with the problem. You see, the society, the community here has tried to chain him. The community here has tried to restrain him. And they have come to the to the realization that they can't do anything about this. So now, because they can't do anything about it, they, they want to keep him contained. We'll contain him because we can't cure the problem. And there are some problems that are so spiritual in nature that society, apart from Jesus, couldn't do anything anyway. This is why even the development of a society without Christ is always a horrible idea. Because it's better to fail with Jesus than to succeed without him. You say, you say, well, I'm trying to build something and it doesn't seem as if it's coming together. That's okay. As long as he's the center of it, keep on attempting to build it. Because whenever you try to build something where he is not the center, the resistance you experience will not be the devil, it will be God. Sometimes you think that the thing that's being destroyed is because the devil is messing it up. No, it's not the devil, it's God. Because God won't let you build something where he's not the center of it. He comes seeking this man, and what I love about it is that this man is not looking for Jesus. This man is not seeking Jesus. His condition, the society can't cure. The society can't fix it. In fact, here's the way the text says it. He's been chained and he breaks the chains day and night. He's now shrieking and Jesus in verse 8. But Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion because there are many of us inside this man. And then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant, distant place. What I kind of like about this is that the, the, the demons are approaching Jesus come and they say, listen, are you here to torture us before the time? Why do they ask that question? Because they've read the Bible too and they know the story. And they know their time is limited. And it's strange when a demon has more faith. (laughs) 
the demons have more faith than some Christians because they believe his word. The demons say, have you come to torture us before the time? Because they believe what he has said will happen, will happen. And then the demons pray. You see, when you beg again and again and again and say, please let us depart into the herd of swine, that's prayer. And I would argue that the demons have more faith than some Christians. You see, demonic faith is an interesting thing. I've been reading about North Dakota. And so I know a little bit about North Dakota. If you were to ask me some facts about North Dakota, I could give you some facts on North Dakota. But I've never been there. And there are some people when it comes to Jesus, they know facts. But they've never experienced him. And it's one thing to have facts. It's another thing to have the experience. Am I making any sense to you? You can have the facts about the Lord. You can have the facts about Christ. And yet never have experienced his transforming power in your soul. And when that's the case, all you have is a demonic faith, not a dynamic faith. Because you've given mental and cognitive assent to facts, but you really haven't encountered the Savior. Yeah, they know about him, but they don't believe in him. And Jesus comes and literally says to them, cool. They leave the man and enter a herd of swine. And this gives you some indication of evil spirit behavior because the swine immediately, all 2,000 of them, make their way to the water and they are drowned and they die. I don't have time to go into this, but when you read the New Testament in connection with the Old Testament, whenever you were able to give a name or get a name, it was a demonstration of power. When the demonic forces call him Jesus and then beg him in the name of God, it's because they're really trying to usurp his authority because even they understood in the ancient world that when you gave a name and were able to receive a name, it was a demonstration of power. That's why Adam names the creation in the Genesis account. Because in naming the account, he has authority, superiority over the creation. That's why when Jacob is wrestling with the theanthropic being, the angel, when he's wrestling with that individual, he says, what's your name? And the angel refuses to give his name, but changes Jacob's name. Because it was a demonstration of power, helping them to understand who is superior in this enterprise. And so the demonic forces are trying to usurp the authority of Jesus. That's why when he says, what's your name? They give him a number. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you into the herd of the swine as you requested, and they drown. Now, here's what you got to understand. It's the same water that Jesus just came through in a storm that because of this connection with evil powers comes up quickly in order to take Jesus' life. And now the same evil entity is responsible for doing what the demons did not want and taking their lives. Pigs are not Stampede animals. But these pigs stampede right to their own inn and are destroyed. And it's not news to Jesus, it's news to the culture because the community has a fit at the loss of pigs in spite of the fact that a person has been delivered. It says something about the priority of a community that values pigs more than people. Because we're fine as long as we can contain you. But when you mess with our profit margin, when you start to mess with our business, and you see, there is a culture that wants to keep you insane and keep you out of control and keep you indecent. And as long as you remain out of your mind, they are satisfied. But the minute you come to your senses, the minute you realize that it is Christ that can settle you and stabilize you and change the direction of your life, that same culture will turn on you. 
Because it likes keeping you out of your mind. Am I making sense to you? There's a community that earns its, its, its economy based upon your insanity. And as long as you remain insane, you stabilize an economy. But the minute you come to your sense and realize there's another way to live and another way to love and another way to coexist, the man was demon possessed, running around a graveyard, chained and naked, breaking chains naked, howling at night, and they were fine. Now that he is clothed, and sane and sitting, which is the posture of a disciple. Now that he is sitting and in the presence of Jesus, now they're afraid and here's what they do. They say to Jesus, leave our town. Because when you take out 2,000 of our pigs, I don't believe this community at all is Jewish. I believe it is Gentile. When you take out our profit margin, now we've got a problem with you. And this is why there's a world out there that wants to keep you insane. And the minute you discover Christ as the center of your life and the satisfier of your soul, you throw things in disarray. Because there is an economy that's been built on your insanity. Clothed, sane sitting in his right mind, and now they're afraid, and they say to Jesus, you leave. And here's what I need you to know. You see, Jesus won't stay where he's not wanted. <laughs> you say, well, I don't want nothing to do with you, Jesus. Well, it's okay. The thing I like about Christ, the thing I like about the Holy Spirit is that he doesn't conquer us in order to draw us in. He doesn't win us like a viceroy or a leader who destroys us in order to win us. He loves us into submission. That's the only reason you're still breathing. Because we have all lived recklessly and senselessly. We've all lived a life so that if he wanted to take us out, he could have taken us out. But what did he do? Even when we were deep in our sin, he loved us into submission. And rather than kill us, he kept bringing us up and bringing us up. Do I have a witness anywhere? You, you know you should be dead, but because of the grace of God and the mercy of God, we sit in this sanctuary on this day, listen, clothed and sane in our right minds. And you know we did act a fool. We were just as nutty as we could be, just as insane as we could be. Haven't you once or twice stood in the mirror and said, how could I have been so stupid? But God in your stupidity was still loving you and keeping you. And by his grace, here we stand on a Sunday afternoon on the 24th of April. Is God not good? Is God not merciful? Do I have a witness somewhere? They, they want Jesus to leave. And so they say, look, you get out of our community, you get out of town because... Jesus said, all right, fine, I'm going to take off. There's three requests in this text. In the first request, it is the demonic saying, listen, let us go into the herd of swine. And he grants their request. The second request is the townspeople who say, Lord, we're sick of you here. You're messing up the economy. Um, we need you to leave. And he says, fine, I'm getting into my boat. But then there's a man who, after having been visited by a God who seeks people in the graveyard, who saves, delivers, Strengthens people in the graveyard. Now this man is about to be sent. And he comes to Jesus. He says here in this text, inside verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him, but Jesus said no. Three requests. Two he says yes to. One he says no. I want you to stay. Now I don't have time to really unpack this, but I, I want you to be able to get this because... I want you to at least recognize that when this monster becomes a man, when, when, this, when this terror finally now embraces a testimony, that there's something to understand about this. Demon possession in the Bible is mysterious. No one knows 
how one becomes demon possessed. That is not something the New Testament is clear about. The New Testament is murky in terms of how a person is possessed by a demon. I have some ideas and I know for one that, that the potential for demon possession exists when there is the perpetuation of sin that you won't turn from, repent from. But, but the New Testament is very quiet on how one becomes demon possessed. And whenever one is demon possessed in the New Testament, the response to demon possession is not rebuke. It is not repudiation. Because the demon possessed are oppressed. And what the demon possessed need is liberation, not ridicule. The demon possessed are not told to somehow in a rebuked way. Uh, the, the, the demon possessed are not aggressive. This man is hurting no one but himself. And what he needs is not to be rebuked. He needs to be liberated from his oppression. He doesn't need to be pushed to the margins. He needs a liberator. And what Jesus comes to prove to be in the life of the demon-possessed man who is a victim. He gives that man liberation when he wasn't seeking it. When he wasn't, when he wasn't looking for deliverance, the Lord came to deliver him. Now, now, the work of Satan is a little bit different because in the work of Satan, it's more aggressive and the, the work of Satan versus the work of demons is not oppressive, it is aggressive. And the work of Satan needs to be judged. Much more violent. In the work of Satan, he is the victimizer. In the work of demon possession, the person is a victim. What they need is the life-giving, liberating work of Christ who can free them from their oppressed state. You say, well, how does one become demon-possessed? I don't know. The Bible hasn't been clear about that. But I know a gateway is when one decides to persist in a sinful lifestyle without repentance. You then open the door. The strange thing is that Christ liberates this man, and his liberation, his new life, is a bigger splash than the pigs. He says, I want to go with you. In a kind of um, parliament funkadelic groove, he says, I'd rather be with you. Yeah. And the Lord says, no, you stay. Why? Because they think that they're getting rid of me. But, but I can be present even when I'm absent if you stay. And I know you want to go with me, but I'd rather you stay where you are because I need you to go back to your family and go back to your friends. Because when God's grace visits the graveyard, it seeks, it saves, and then it sends. It takes the transformed woman or man and sends them back out so that they can be the mouthpiece to tell others of the good news about what it is God has done for them. And you see, the thing about God is that whenever you try to push God out, if you look around, there's always going to be enough DNA evidence that support he's been there somehow. They thought they were getting rid of Jesus, but there was a man who had been transformed. Lord, I wish you understood what I'm trying to say. There's a man now who's taken up the mantle of telling everybody 
about the goodness of a merciful God who sought him when he wasn't seeking him, who saved him and strengthened him when he couldn't do it for himself, and now the monster has become a missionary. The terror now has a testimony. The one who was shrieking is now speaking on behalf of the Christ that has saved his life. And everywhere that man went, whether you wanted to know it or not, he was DNA evidence, proof positive of the power of God that can turn anything around. That's the nature of our God. I'm glad that God has done what he's done in our lives. He has saved us and brought us up and now sends us out. You say, Williams, what should I do? Go tell somebody. If he fixed your mind, tell him who did it. If he saved your soul, tell him he did it. If he picked you up, turned you around, planted you on solid ground, tell somebody that there's a God that visits the graveyard. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters, he's lifted me and now safe, stabilized, sane, clothed in my right mind, am I? Tell somebody about the mercy of God in your life. Never be ashamed to testify of how he came, sought you, turned your mind around, and give glory and honor to him so the world can know.